two, three.
Testing, one, two, three. Allison Gibson will be introducing the speakers today during the Space Based Robotics session. We have two speakers, each one will take about 20 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions at the end for both of them. <coughs> so, as most of you know, um, Space Based Robotics is an emerging field right now, and as robotics progress in being autonomous and more functional, there's going to be more interaction between robots and humans. So you'll see that both of our speakers actually incorporate that human factor into their research. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Panagiotis Artemiadis, who's a professor here at ASU. He runs the Human Oriented Robotics and Control Lab. So, yeah. Thank you, Allison. Um, so good morning, everybody. My name is Panagiotis Artemiadis, and I go by Panos. Um, I'm the director of the Hork Lab in uh, Arizona State University in Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. And I have to say something uh, up front. I don't do space robotics. But I do work on robotics, on the robotics field, and essentially human-oriented robotics. And I can see many, many applications that are related to space robotics. So let's start. This is the first picture that I came up many years ago when I wanted to describe what I'm doing. Uh, I'm doing interfaces, um, control interfaces between humans and robots, either at the central level, essentially the brain, how you can use your brain to control systems, to control external devices, to, con to teleoperate the devices that are even in another planet, or how you can control uh, systems that are attached to you, like prosthetic limbs, or even rehabilitation robotics that have physical interaction with your limbs in order to provide kind of therapy in terms of upper limb or lower limb for essentially gait retraining. So today we're going to focus on two things, control interfaces between humans and robots, 
and physical interfaces between humans and robots. Essentially, robots that physically interface uh, with uh, the human upper and lower limbs. Uh, if I had to choose only one word to describe my research field, research field that would be new robotics. And these are some uh, examples of new robotics platforms. You can go 50 years ago, uh, General Electric, uh, they developed this huge exoskeleton here. And now we have these very nice exoskeletons. Uh, we have these prosthetic devices or exoskeletons for uh, augmenting human capabilities. So these are some cases of new robotic devices. I'm going to focus on myoelectric interfaces. And what I mean by that is how we can use signals generated by our muscles in order to control robotic devices. And here's a simple uh, block diagram that says, OK, the brain essentially is activating our muscles. And then the muscles produce that force that corresponds to torque around the joints. And finally, what you have is an output. So I'm moving my arm now by just flexing my muscles, and my brain is sending those signals to those muscles. However, if I'm missing part of my limb, I can, I can still use the remaining muscles in order to control now an external device. And that's the prosthetic device. Let's go into more details. What's an electromyographic signal, or an EMG signal? That's a characteristic uh, EMG signal from triceps or biceps of your arm. And that essentially tells you that it's activated when you flex your arm, when you flex the specific muscle. But as you can see, it's a very, very noisy signal. And we have to take that information now and decode that information to motion, or an upper limb uh, prosthesis, for example. In terms of recording the information, it's very, very easy. We have those surface electrodes you just put them on your skin, and they record the muscle activity. And now in the lab, we have the wireless version of this. So you can actually go in another building, and we can still record your muscle activation. In terms of the information that the EMG signal has, well, it's very, very important because it has information about two things. The first one is, of course, motion. When I move my arm, the muscle is flexed, so you get something like that. And so there is information about motion. But what's very, very important is information about force, or even stiffness, or generally impedance. And I'm pretty sure you all know what's impedance. So you can think of a spring. Stiffness is a part of the impedance. A spring has a specific stiffness, but I cannot really see that stiffness unless I push the spring, I feel that force, and see how much it displays so I know the stiffness. EMG is very, very important and very useful in that case because I can now, you can now see my EMG signals from the arm as I flex or as I co-contract all my muscles, and you can have an estimation of impedance without even touching my arm. So, EMG is very uh, informative in that case. These are some very early works that I did in my PhD probably five or six years ago. Uh, we were able to record signals from uh, uh, specific muscles of the upper limb and essentially teleoperate the robotic arm. In the left case, you can see 2D arm teleoperations, only two degrees of freedom. In the right case, you can see that we can actually control in real time seven deg uh, sorry, five degrees of freedom of that robotic arm by using 11 of those muscles here. And of course, in that case, the user has visual contact with the robotic arm, so he can compensate for any errors. But you can think that you can teleoperate a robotic arm that's another path by only essentially moving your own arm. Please. These are now videos that uh, we recorded a year ago in my lab. So I joined the year 2011. And since then, we were very, very active. And I was very lucky to get uh, very good students from ASU. One of them is Alison Gibson, the moderator of that talk. Uh, she's actually working on uh, this project here, where what you have is, again, uh, five or six EMG electrodes recording a muscle activation from the forearm and then controlling that virtual uh, robotic, arm, a robotic hand. On the video on the right, what you can see is a user controlling that robot arm and hand that we have in the lab in real time by only using his EMG signals. So the nice thing, the thing that's very, very exciting here is not that it's not the fact that you can actually control the robot arm by using your muscles. Well, this is exciting, but it's not as exciting as the next one, which is this user has never used that interface before. Let me give you more details. So all the previous work, all the previous studies on how you can use your neural signals in order to control device depend on the training period. And that training period means 
you have a subject, you have him, you have him record, uh, do motions for about 10 to 15 minutes. You record the neural signals, the EMG signals, and you kind of build a mathematical function that relates the signals to motion. And that mathematical function is only for that su subject. If you now come to the lab, you have to go through the training again. Well, this system is not subject specific. This subject has never been seen by the system. The system was actually trained in February 2011. This video was recorded somewhere June or July um, 2013. And the system has never seen that specific subject. So you come in the lab, you put the electrodes, five minutes, you are done, you can control the system. And that's, I think, the most important thing about what we have done on this field. So as I said before, in all the previous case, what you need to have is that mathematical function that says essentially build a mapping between the neural signals and the motion. So that's what we call a decoder. Our next step is actually to get rid of that decoder. Why? Well, because we have a very, very nice computers in our head. That's our brain. And our brain is very, very adaptive and intelligent, of course. So what we are thinking is now have the brain directly control that device and not go through the muscle activation through a decoder function, through a mathematical function. Let the brain adapt to uh, this mechanical device. And now instead of using, instead of controlling your physical arm, your natural arm, you control that robotic device directly. In order to do that, in order to test how this works, we came up with a very, very simple example. It's essentially a video game for a user. So the user is here. Uh, we are recording four EMG uh, signals from four different muscles of the forearm. And he has to play that very dull game, which is essentially you start with a target at the center, and you have to move that, uh, that red dot here to one of the eight targets here. And the instruction to the subject is what I have here. Use your muscles to play the game. So essentially, have your brain adapt to this neural interface to this new interface that you have in front of you and just think about the motion and the motion will uh, happen. So uh, if we go into more details, what we were controlling is the velocity of that target here as a function of the EMG signals. But this is something that the user does not know in advance. So the user has, the brain of the user essentially has to adapt to that specific map. So that's trial one, the first time that you try to do that. It takes 10.3 seconds to just move the target from the center to this target here, and that was your path. You actually succeed in 10 seconds, it's very good news, but that's not an optimal path. That's trial two, you get better. 8.3 seconds, and the trajectory that you follow is much more, uh, it's, I guess, better than the previous one. That's trial four, that's trial eight. So only after eight trials, your brain has adapted to that specific mapping, and now you just need 2.3 seconds to control that device directly from your brain. And now you can think of all the other applications that we can have based on that system. Now you think of the system, you think of a robot as another planet, you can have visual feedback of that, and you just think of controlling it, and you control it in real time. Uh, that's a graph that shows the completion time with respect to trials. You see that you actually need only three trials. Only three times you need, you need to attempt to control that and you are done. Your brain has already adapted to this new uh, control interface. The nice thing, these are uh, filtered EMG signals. Essentially is the muscle activation uh, throughout those trials. So here is what the biceps was doing for trial one during those 10 seconds. And here, what's, what the biceps, for example, was doing in trial eight. What you see is that our brain has adapted and has changed the planning and the control of that muscle in order to play that game. You see how noisy this is and how after eight trials we have exactly understand the mapping? So essentially, that's a very nice thing about the adaptation mechanisms and the neuroplasticity of the brain. You can control any device as long as you have this visual feedback and you can adapt your control system. And of course, as I said, applications can be for a robot arm that is another planet, for underwater robotics, and we're now focusing on prosthetic limbs, how we can have hand abilities or arm abilities to control their devices by just thinking about controlling them. Uh, let me go to another uh, 
project that we have in the lab, and that's okay. So let's now that you have your um, prosthetic limb, but you still need to have some tactile feedback. So let's say I'm an amputee, I'm wearing my advanced prosthesis, and I want to touch that cup of water here, but I want to feel also that I'm touching this. So how we send that proprioceptive feedback back to the user, back to the amputee? And there are many, many uh, labs that have worked on how to activate uh, neural cells or even nerves at the peripheral nerves of the upper limbs in order to provide that feedback. But that's invasive, so you have to essentially electrically stimulate uh, nerves or the brain, which is something that I don't think that we want to do. So we came up with a new uh, solution. We first developed a glove that has many, many force sensors here. So these uh, small dots are force sensors. They give you just a vertical force of that specific point, and we have about 25 sensors on that glove. Let me show you what happens when you touch objects. So these bars here represent force. And of course, as you see, manipulation is a very complex thing. You have multiple points that uh, um, interface with the real world, so you have different forces, etc. It would be nice to build a, an interface in order to get that information now and send it back to the user. And uh, we came up with a very nice idea. Let's now transform those forces to sound. Essentially, now you are hearing forces. Okay? So what we did is take these four signals and essentially t uh, ma uh, manipulate them as uh, different frequencies. So this is the result here, and I can explain more. For mid sensor, we take an amplitude that represents force, and we uh, we um, uh, we make this a specific sine wave of a specific amplitude. The amplitude is a function of the force, but each sensor has its own frequency. And actually, we have many sensors that have different uh, that have the same frequencies. But essentially, you can uh, think of having three different frequencies throughout the pulse. So, for example, th those two fingers here, index and middle finger, have a specific frequency. Then the ring and the pinky finger have another frequency. And the amplitude of that specific sine wave is a function of the force that uh, you, should, you feel through the glove. So let me turn on the sound here. And here you can actually hear how it sounds to hear forces. So here are the forces. The subject is manipulating that object, and you can hear the, the, um, uh, the forces that uh, you cannot feel through the glass. So now we can take that interface and put it, we can take actually that specific lab, put it on the prosthetic uh, hand, and you can now hear the forces of the prosthetic hand. The very exciting thing, which is also a project that Alton is working on, is that users can adapt to that uh, interface. So we have healthy subjects, they are remotely operating this uh, prosthetic uh, hand that we have in the lab. On top of the hand we have that glove with the four sensors and uh, we are running our system with uh, four sound um, transformation. And the subjects are able to learn that mapping after only a few trials. I have seen experiments where the subjects are blindfolded and they manipulate or grasp an object at the precision grip by only using those sounds that are uh, derived from the four signals. So, so that's very promising. It's not invasive and uh, it's very effective in terms of force feedback to the user. Uh, another thing that we are working in the lab is exoskeletons, devices that you wear that physically interface with you and can be used for many different purposes. One could be to uh, augment human capabilities to make you able to lift a heavy object, for example, or for assistive devices for the elderly that don't have enough uh, muscle activation, so uh, this exoskeleton can uh, help them interface with their wall, or even for therapy for stroke patients that cannot uh, that need to re regain the control of their muscles, and the exoskeleton is helping with that. So the first thing that we were interested in building is the actual physical interface between the robot, the exoskeleton, and you. And these are all the requirements that we wanted to uh, meet. Here are some examples of other exoskeletons, and as you can see, in most of the cases, you need, really need to hold the end effect or the end point of the exoskeleton, as you have here, here, 
here uh, and also the sarcos exoskeletal, you need to hold the endpoint of the exoskeletal. So we don't want to do that because if if your hand is already occupied by holding the exoskeleton, then you can't really interface with the wall. So we developed this very nice and very simple coupling device. It's only a magnetic device, so you have four small magnets there. And whenever you want to decouple from the exoskeleton, essentially from the robot, you just pull your arm away and it decouples, because it's just uh, four small magnets. Whenever you want to couple again, you just approach your arm to the robot, it's coupled magnetically, and that's it. So you have a very nice, effective, safe, uh, completely passive uh, physical interface with the uh, robot. Here's a video that shows how easy it is to do that. So this is our robot arm that we have in the lab. We are now we don't have an exoskeleton yet, but we are using the robot arm as an exoskeleton. So we have this uh, coupling here. It takes about 10 to 15 seconds for the user to couple to the device, and once you are coupled, that's it, you can transmit forces and torques to the robot. So now the robot is completely passive. Essentially, gravitational, uh, the gravitational dynamics are cancelled, and it's like having a robot on, in space, and then you can transmit forces in all directions and torques. Whenever you want to decouple, you just pull your arm, and that's it. So, very cheap, very safe. Uh, non-active, just uh, four magnets, and you can actually control that decoupling force. The range that we have, based on the magnet that we can find in the market, is from 5 newtons to 250 newtons. So we can change that decoupling force as we want. Another thing that I'm thinking when I think about space robotics and how all this stuff that I'm doing in the lab, myself and my students are doing in the lab, uh, are, can be applied to space robotics is how you can collaborate with a robot. So let's say that you have a big robot here, an exoskeleton, or essentially a robot that can replace your left arm. And what we are interested in is coming up with controllers that will make that robot move anthropomorphically. I don't know if it's clear, but here, this is a conf uh, configuration of the robot that is anthropomorphic. It reminds you of the shoulder, the elbow, and the wrist of the robot. So if you see that robot collaborating with you, you kind of understand its intention. That's the most important thing. While this is not anthropomorphic, you can never have your elbow touching your stomach here. So that's not an anthropomorphic configuration. And we came up with controllers in order to have any robot uh, come up with anthropomorphic configurations. And so uh, that robot can collaborate with humans. So space applications. The first thing, of course, is exoskeletons. And one thing, if you see all the exoskeletons, the state-of-the-art exoskeletons uh, that are around, they all focus on how to amplify force. I want to lift that heavy object, that heavy object here. But what I'm saying is here is that weightlifting is not the only thing you want from an exoskeleton. What we really want from an exoskeleton is control of impedance. So let's see how important is impedance. So imagine yourself landing here. There's going to be a huge impact on your legs. What if you wear an exoskeleton that would absorb more of that energy because of the variable stiffness, variable impedance of the exoskeleton? The same thing here. You are holding this and you know that you're going to have a huge force in that direction. You can hold it through an exoskeleton. The exoskeleton will adjust the impedance in that specific direction, and that's it. You don't now feel this impact. So that's the exoskeleton part of that. And that's how we envision to have an exoskeleton, essentially a portable backpack robot that can physically interface with you and can adjust and stick. So we're now working on building that exoskeleton. Uh, also, I was searching how we can apply the, this force sound cross model feedback that we came up with in the lab in space. So this is the picture that I found yesterday when I was uh, searching for Neil, uh, Neil Armstrong gloves. Uh, these are the gloves that he used many years ago. This is more the state of the art now. But these are huge, and you can't really feel forces through that glove. So imagine now that we equip those gloves here with force sensors. We take these force measurements, we transform them to sound, and that's it. Now you have tactile feedback through that huge glass. So that's also a very interesting space application. All right, I'm going to stop here. Uh, this is the most important slide of my talk, which is the list of the names of the students that worked with me during the last two and a half years that have been at ASU. 
So I'm really grateful that I had so many students and so uh, uh, intelligent students. Since I'm talking to mostly undergrads and graduate students from different universities, please feel free to talk with your professors and get something done, done in their labs. It's very, very important to get that experience and in most of the times the projects are very successful as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Artemiadis. So our next speaker is Dr. Jack Tanga, another professor here at ASU that leads the Space and Terrestrial Robotic Exploration Lab, which is in this building, actually. Thank you. So just a quick introduction. Um, this talk will be about robotic space exploration and in-situ resource utilization. And our work over the past, um, I guess, seven, eight years in, in support of all of these technologies. Um, OK. So first thing I want to talk about is my story, how I got into space. And uh, it starts off with the, with the Canada arm and the Dexter project, uh, which is the uh, main space robotic arm on the, on the space station. So you might have already seen on the orbital presentation of how spacecraft get to dock easily with the spacecraft. So this is one of the technologies that's been used to do that. The other, and, and this, is, this is the STS-100 where, where this, was, this was launched. So it was one of those critical moments seeing um, something that we built over a couple of years going to space. Um, and it has made uh, a lot of fame. Um, one example is that it's now on the new Canadian $5 bill. Um, and, and what we can say is mass movements towards space is possible. And I, I would look forward to the day to see the moon landing or something of that stature of the U.S. space program on a U.S. dollar note. So th that was one of, my, one of the earliest opportunities I had in space. The other, the other was in developing the Orbital uh, Express uh, spacecraft. And I had a very you know, minor role to play. And that was trying to determine best ways of getting a robot system in space to go in and dock onto another pre-floating robotic system. Okay. And that would, in a sense, ease up your chances of, of trying to um, align multiple spacecraft together to do refueling and then docking and passing out information and doing servicing. Okay? So the, the big challenges then were, were to try to understand the, the dynamics of these, the contact dynamics, try to design the proper materials, and, and try to come up with an overall simple system. And so my little task in that case was to run the simulations. And so that, in a sense, changed my path from that point onwards, this internship experience, which then showed uh, and got me into a PhD program where I was working on, on rovers, um, on um, the ESA ExoMars prototype, which is still ongoing work after about 12 years, um, the Northern Light Rover concepts, and then rovers for in situ resource utilization and excavation. Uh, Apologies, sir. So that then followed on towards more, more uh, difficult task of, of trying to build robots, or groups of robots, and trying to do exploration. And then we've also looked at these technologies towards providing um, advanced power systems for um, the next generation of space suits. In other words, provide enabling technology so you can have people uh, in space suits operating for extended periods of time and having um, higher energy density propulsion and power systems so that they can be very mobile. So our motivation, the big picture motivation out of our work is that our existence on this pale blue dot is tenuous. 
There are the threats of asteroid impacts and other cataclysmic effects that could just wipe us out um, of our existence. And here comes along, you know, these asteroids, and, and uh, this is a nice uh, picture of what that you know, encapsulates into the space program, that an asteroid is a nature's way of asking, how's that space program coming along? And, and we sort of fall into this greater vision of, of humanity's aspirations and ability towards exploring uh, space and colonization. So our, our mission as part of this research group is to research space system technologies that can lead to great paradigm changes in space exploration and, and colonization. And we want to work on the small technologies, not necessarily the big technologies, but that could have an impact on this. So the areas that we're interested in working on are interplanetary ecosystems, network space exploration systems, in situ resource utilization, high energy power and propulsion systems in support of other great space programs, and certainly network robotics, which is both the space and, and terrestrial applications. So with, with these research areas, what we see is that the major challenges and the opportunities are interdisciplinary. And it requires a whole mix of people. The space scientists, the aerospace, the mechanical, the electrical, and the chemical engineers, the artists and the animators, the biologists and the astrobiologists, and also the computer scientists, among uh, among to name a few. And so branching away from our, 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 our research group's you know, major goals, I wanted to talk about some of our past work in uh, in situ resource utilization. And the grand vision behind this is to set up a lunar base. And that was, that has evolved over time. You know, the grand vision of having terraformed domes with green pastures inside, inside uh, domes and on the moon has, has over, over time, this is, these are the early 1970s concepts of the network of cities, have, have in a sense, faded. Okay? Our, our dreams have, have, in a sense, decreased. Um, this is the 1989 concept, this is the 1993 concept, and this is the 2004 concept. <laughs> so as you can see, the space, uh, the, the, this, this lunar base is shrinking, okay? But we don't want to let it go, okay? And, and our, as part of our mission, it was to look at some of the feasibilities of the building of lunar base. How to make it feasible in real world dollars in present time, so that this doesn't, in a sense, you know, bankrupt nations. So the basics for a lunar base, we feel, is that the, you know, the first major steps would be to develop a robotic base. Okay? And, and part of running a robotic base is you've got to have energy to run this. You've got to have the proper temperature and radiation shielding so that your robotic devices operate properly. In addition, you're going to have to have the resources for repair and communication. So you have this whole process um, self-organizing and, and uh, working away. Okay? So one of the roles of this resupply base would be to refuel and resupply uh, tra uh, uh, transiting spacecraft. So you have one of these assets laid out. Uh, this includes the uh, Lagrangian points. This includes the moon, maybe other spots. And this could now be an asset for all future missions that can transit through the spot. And so then you can save costs. And it would be a more, stepping, uh, a more ambitious stepping stone for human exploration. Mars and beyond. So with lunar in situ resource utilization, there's been extensive work um, with the Clementine and the um, various other probes that have mapped the lunar surface. Examples on the top picture here is Ilmenite distribution, where it's dark blue, there are higher concentrations. This is from Chandrayaan, which shows um, hints of possibly water or, or hydrogen content being at its uh, highest at the poles of the moon. So these could be your major uh, resources to, to uh, enable this uh, refueling um, station on the moon. So to, to be able to get your resources, you would need robots to collect these resources. Okay? And then go through a process to convert ilmenite, uh, moon rock, um, through a, uh, to, uh, it's, it's generally heated up to 900 degrees centigrade, and all of this could be based on um, solar thermal and uh, photovoltaic systems, in other words, free power, 
but, that's, but the infrastructure would have to be built. And, and based on this process, come out with iron, titanium oxide on one end, and then you're going to get your water, uh, which can then be separated um, with, with reuse of hydrogen into oxygen. So with this whole process, what you can get is oxygen out of moon rock. Okay. Uh, in addition, if you do find, find water in large quantities, you can just uh, omit this part of the process and just use electrolysis to uh, produce your oxygen and hydrogen. Currently, this process has, has been demonstrated successfully by Lockheed Martin in 2008 um, at the slopes of Mauna Kea, Hawaii. Um, there's still a long way to go with uh, using ilmenite earth rock to do this. The uh, efficiency of the process is just 2%. Okay? There's still a very long way to make things this practical. But part of that process and part of what's instrumental about it is is to get robotic systems to try to increase the concentration of your, of your material input to do your processing. Okay? So, as I said, water is not abundant, hence it needs to be searched and mined. And same with the ilmenite. Keys to effectively harness the renewable power sources, gathering resources, either ilmenite or water, to support a base. And, and with this, this is where we see biological inspiration towards the application for robotics in, in space. So biologically inspired ideas we feel are, are very well suited for space robotic systems. And, and one is the model of natural selection. The, the simplest of, uh, among these are, are evolutionary algorithms. And, and if you were to look at you know, biology and, and, and the biological world, or the natural world, you have evolution, and over millions of uh, millions and, uh, years, you've had these different organisms formed that, in a sense, um, have their, their end design goal is to survive, and they're formed, and, and they've come up with different, unique, and you know, wonderful designs to survive. Okay. So we, in a sense, try to extract that essential process towards the development of space robotic systems. In other words, to meet your mission requirements. And to then you know, use artificial evolutionary means to design and control your spacecraft. So where we further take inspiration from this, this capability is, is social insects. So social insects, particularly ants, termites, and bees, have, have exhibit some of the highest forms of cooperation. Their altruism to the extreme. Some of the you know, neat things about these social insects is that they're the only other organism apart from humans known to domesticate other organisms. Uh, they're the only others to know uh, how to you know, do farming. In other words, they can plant more crops or, or, or food, and, and they can, in a sense, be um, self-organizing um, self societies. They also, they also have a you know, very complex hierarchy as well. So this is an example of, a, of an ant city that was excavated in 2006 by 4K Thaler, and, and part of this documentary uh, narrated by Hal Dobler. And in this, you have complex structures. This is, by all means, equivalent to a human city. Okay? You have tunnel networks, you have networks for growing food, you have um, bridges, you have um, temperature control systems, you have means of trying to get rid of your CO2 that's being uh, emitted uh, because it's growing their own food inside. So it is a very complex system that, that rivals some of our cities in terms of their complexity. And in others, you have these cooperative ants that can, in a sense, form uh, chains and bridges, in other words, use your own bodies as, as physical structures. And these Panamanian ants where you can, if you just put uh, a plank of wood with holes in it, you have a few of them just go in there and plug the holes, letting the others just follow over them. Okay. So this level of self-organization is more further evidence of these, these are termite mounds in Australia. Each one is a separate termite mound where fungus is being grown inside, where it's on a temperature control system where it's uh, emitting out CO2 and pulling in oxygen. This is an example of, of some of the larger ones. But here you have a city of these. Right? And this has occurred over millions of years. So we, in a sense, want to extract some of that essence towards developing um, engineering systems. Okay? In support of exploration, perform site preparation, excavation, <laughs> gather resources. And, and part of this is it's autonomous. Adaptive, unstructured environments deal with minimal supervision and tax decomposition. 
and, and have the ability to have multiple robots. In other words, you have the advantage of scalability, redundancy, robustness, and simplicity. So uh, typically, trying to, if, if you were to theoretically look at these problem spaces, they're very large. Okay? And um, even with some of the simplest of excavation problems, the potential candidate solutions are in the uh, range of 10 to the 53 million. Okay? This is beyond astronomical. And so it's, in that sense, it could be very daunting. But luckily, a lot of these uh, tasks are not a needle in a haystack type uh, problem space. Okay? And so there are a lot of mediocre and, and uh, not so good solutions, which, are, which may be good enough for a mix. Okay? And, and we also use different methods to try to reduce the dimensionality of these problems. One of them includes neural networks. We certainly have other approaches as well. And, and these are methods, certainly biologically inspired methods, to uh, reduce the dimensionality of these problems to make them tractable and solvable. So one of the approaches that we've used is the artificial neural tissue approach, which is you grow your own artificial genomes for your robot controllers. You have them produce your own artificial proteins, which in turn produces your own artificial neural tissue. These are your controllers. Now these controllers are now evolved in a group, and the, uh, the, the fittest survive and uh, mate and mutate, while the unfit ones get culled off. Using that process, we can apply these for uh, complex robotic tasks. Uh, this, is, this is one of the simpler tasks that we did, and this is uh, resource gathering. The idea is uh, these robots look for resource material, in this case, uh, simple packing peanuts in a, in a laboratory setting, and they can, in a sense, search for them and collect them into a uh, particular designated dumping area. The interesting thing about these experiments is that this whole control scheme starts off with a blank slate. Now, if all these cues are here, the robots figure out what they mean through a trial and error learning process. And this is the end result of that learning process. All we do is provide a high level goal. In other words, we um, measure and, and select for individuals that can best collect for resources. And so they do a pretty good job. Um, in this case, they can uh, you know, clean up the spot and, and collect all your resources. Uh, with the application for in situ resource utilization, you have a mother robot that would then collect these resources to do the final processing. So one of the things that you might notice with real robotic systems is that they're not perfect, right? They have limited vision, they have limited capabilities, they make mistakes. But with this multi-robot system, even if one individual makes a mistake, another one can come in and correct it. And so here you have this robustness of a system with imperfect individuals. And we have compared this against human uh, solutions for multi-robot systems. And what we found is, apart from a single robot solution, if you were to scale it up, these systems can perform better than human uh, solutions. Um, here it is, to, you know, we went to the next step, going from packing peanuts to excavating under lunar type conditions. So this is a high fidelity simulation um, of, these, of a group of robots trying to build a landing pad. Uh, it's an L-shaped landing pad, in other words, it's trying to uh, dig into an area and, and, uh, and produce berms all around. So this is so that if a, if a rocket was to land or take off, it wouldn't um, um, spread out debris to the rest of the um, space, um, the lunar base, and, 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 and damage its structures. And, and these are our experiments, in a sense, to scale up these robots, going from, from smaller robots to these larger ones, to do um, excavation here on, on Earth. And so this has been an ongoing process with uh, uh, many companies and, and organizations. And so these are, this has been a part of that effort of, of building these larger size uh, ro robot teams for excavation and drilling on the moon. Um, so the implications of this is ad-based network robotic solutions for lunar-based construction missions. And we looked at you know, what could this mean for a whole mission. It could reduce, uh, it could, could lead to a 50% reduction in launches based on our studies in 2008 and a 75% reduction in launch costs. And then it could lead to a paradigm shift where even if one robot is lost, the mission continues. So that's where the parallelism comes in, the robustness to uncertainty, graceful degradation and performance, task decomposition, <coughs> and minimal dependency on communication. So with this, I wanted to acknowledge all the people who worked on this and all our sponsors over the years. And um, just wanted to say, we are hiring. We're looking for uh, candidates like you who are of all these talents that we would um, require.
require in, in um, going after these uh, difficult but interesting challenges in space. Thank you. So we have time for a couple questions. Uh, if we could have both of our speakers come up, we're going to just go back and forth, and to each one of them, we'll pick somebody from the audience. And uh, we'd like to go first. Who has questions? Raise the hand. Yes. Uh, this question is uh, particularly for Professor Tanga. Yes. Uh, does your research group also indulge in areas concerning uh, sensors and uh, like sensing systems, basically, uh, which 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 basically like science and instrument instrumentation for these operating right. missions? Uh, that's a very good question. We are seeking to actively integrate science instruments uh, on space systems. We don't necessarily focus on the basics of the engineering or the development technologies, but we seek to integrate them uh, in terms of mission design, in terms of mission capabilities. So there is that connection, yes. Does anyone else have a question? This question is for Professor Artem Niadis, did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah. Thanks for your presentation. I saw, I was looking at the difference between the uh, case of the, of the learning, uh, the arm motion game, and the difference between case four and case eight. I saw that uh, both cases kind of had a bias for going in one direction. I assume that that would be like pure bicep motion, for example. Uh, and case four was straight in the direction of the target, and case eight was straight vertical. I was wondering if the uh, system had been calibrated differently for those two cases. Yeah, that's a very good question. So we actually calibrate the system with many, many different cases. We have different mapping functions between the muscles and what we see as the actual motion. What we really were interested in seeing is if you start with a mapping, specific mapping, mapping function, as you say, a specific case, and you adapt to a new one. And we were surprised to see that our brain is capable of adapting to different cases very, very quickly. Actually, we even changed the game. So once you have uh, learned how to control that cursor in eight different positions, we changed the game completely. And now we have a, a helicopter and helipads are around the campus of ASU and you have to drive those helicopters in a completely different manner. And the brain was capable of adapting very quickly and essentially using past knowledge, that's the most important thing, using past knowledge to this new uh, interface. This question is for Professor Tonga. When do you envision this type of to happen on the moon? Uh, a lunar base? The earliest I figure is 10 to 15 years. Um, 10 to 15 years from now? From now. Okay. Um, and I, why would you not consider uh, it being done on Mars, since we already have the curiosity up there? Right. It's, it's just because of the challenges um, in terms of getting assets there, in terms of uh, various other things. Getting to the moon is just three days on a, on a typical rocket mission. Uh, in fact, what could be even more feasible than to the moon is to do this on an asteroid uh, nearby. Okay. Um, and, and so both are these valid stepping stones. And do you envision this to be come from commercial versus government? Because NASA has not moved on the moon for 25 years. Uh, I think it's a, it's a frontier, as, as Rick just mentioned. Um, it's going to be wide open, and whoever has that capability to get there first will will do it. Um, it could be government, it could be commercial, but I'm, I'm uh, betting it's going to be commercial. And you, your 
vision sees more like a rover type thing, uh, mechanical devices versus humanoid devices. Right. Do you think that would move faster or do you think humanoid would move faster? These systems can be simplified enough that I think we don't need the dexterity of a, of a human or a humanoid type robot. Yet. Uh, uh, yet. <laughs> or, or uh, I, I guess what I, what I meant by the base is, is to do resupply and refuel. A very simple, relatively simple mission. Right? But if it were to then be extended towards uh, supporting humans, then that capability has to increase. And then we need to have uh, supporting technologies for that. But this simpler step uh, is, 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 a, is a supporting asset for everything else. And my last question would be, um, we, we talk about going to the moon and to Mars and everything, but really we need to be working on vehicles that can go, you know, make them cost efficient to go up into space and get us there first so we can get there. Um, yes. To... Yes, uh, we agree. I mean, I mean, this, this great advancement uh, happening in terms of just getting us there from, from the ground to the Earth. But that we have chosen not to sort of work on, because there are lots of great people working on that area. But then it's beyond LEO, but there's still a lot of work to do. Because that has been a limiting factor right now because of how many uh, astronauts could get beyond uh, LEO, uh, or, or you know, how many countries and, and capabilities and companies that can get beyond LEO. So um, part of that is, is to you know, have this forward-looking approach of working on, on technologies uh, that are not necessarily bigger and, and faster, but smaller and more efficient. Thank you. Thank you. Got one right here. Um, this is for Professor Armianis. Uh, Sorry. Um, your presentation here was mostly about uh, EMG for your neural systems. Have you experimented with EEG systems as well? Um, and if so, how did you clean up the data uh, information you got because last year I made an EEG wheelchair and that was a huge pain in the uh, rear end because we kept getting false signals and if we wanted to turn left it would crash into a wall on the right side. <laughs> so how would you uh, clean up those signals? So I haven't uh, worked with EEG yet. We have worked with um, signals directly from the brain using invasive techniques okay. with monkeys and humans. Uh, I haven't worked with EEG yet, however, this is something that I plan for the future. Uh, as an advice, EEG is not a good source of information regarding real-time control. You can get a general behavior of the system or uh, have a, a general idea of what I'm thinking now from EEGs, uh, but I wouldn't recommend EEG signals for real-time control of something that's moving because you are going to get to these problems that you refer to. Thank you. Right here. Uh, I was wondering for the ant excavators, uh, what parameters did the uh, units have available to change in their programming for each each successive time? And was that done in real time, or they kind of figured out on the job, or did you simulate it and then put the most successful program onto the excavators themselves? Right. Um, we evolved this offline. So typically the evolution process goes for about an hour to two, depending on the speed of your computer. We take the fittest individual after, say, 5,000 generations, and then we implement them on the real robot to validate their control system. And, and which parameters did you uh, So uh, in terms of input parameters, um, they have um, rudimentary vision sensors. So they can sense uh, what's in front of them in terms of obstacles and other robots. They can also sense uh, the, the soil depth in front of them uh, in absolute terms. Uh, in addition, they can, um, they can also lay virtual pheromone. Okay. Uh, so one can lay a pheromone, which another can sense that some other robot has been there. So with, with those uh, parameters, um, um, they then uh, figure out this whole emergent process of excavating. In terms of our inputs, as human inputs, we, what we provide them is a three-dimensional map of, of the desired terrain which we want at the end, uh, versus what the current terrain is. And so the system then um, has these individual robots, all decentralized without a central supervisor, all working in 
their own niche area and then coming together towards solving that entire time. Hi, uh, this is Director Towards Professor uh, Tanga. Um, so I, I would imagine that colonization is more uh, complex than exploring. <coughs> so we would need to have, has that been experimented and tested? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. Uh, I would imagine that colonization is uh, more complex than exploring. Right. So we would need repair. So has that been experimented and tested on these uh, robots? We have not looked into repair and, and replacement of technologies, but we have uh, partners who have. And uh, one area, um, NASA uh, Marshall Space Flight Center has been actively looking into 3D printing technology particularly for lunar applications. So they have been looking towards making use of the iron that comes out from, um, from your uh, waste product as, as part of you know, trying to get out oxygen and looking at titanium and, and trying to create parts uh, on the fly um, for the space, say on the moon, instead of, instead of having to send back a mission to you know, get new repair parts and such. But there's still a lot of work to do to uh, do autonomous repair, uh, autonomous sensing of, of um, you know, damage and, and losses of individuals in these systems. But, but what's advantageous about our system is that even if one individual uh, stops working, the rest of the system continues to operate with a, in, a, in a graceful manner. Um, this also speaks for in terms of radiation exposure. Um, typical with, with conventional control systems, if you were to you know, have one bit flip or, or one change in, in, in a critical piece of data, it could have catastrophic consequences. With this, again, you see this graceful degradation. In other words, you need uh, close to maybe about 5 to 10 percent damage of the controller before you see catastrophic uh, changes. So I think we have just enough time for one more question. Does anybody have one? My question is for Dr. A. Um, you mentioned that you uh, tested the sensing with uh, the blindfolds and healthy um, people. Have you? And you also mentioned about research in prosthetics. Um, have you tested it with something like an amputee or something like that? We haven't yet, but uh, we're going to do that in probably three months from now. We're collaborating with uh, a prosthetic prosthetist here in Phoenix, Arizona, and. Uh, we already have patients planned for uh, planned for uh, doing using their own advanced prosthesis because most of them they already have a robotic prosthesis. Uh, uh, we are going, they are going to use that with our cross model feedback for sensing forces, and we're going to test if this works. All right, let's put our hands together for a speaker.